Welcome to the 13th episode in Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Elizabeth Kincaid Ehlers, who comes to us by way of West Hartford. She is a woman for all seasons, being a psychotherapist by day, a poet by night, an adoring grandmother by nature, and a PhD in English and American literature, creative writing as well. Elizabeth is the author of three full-length poetry collections and a contributor to anthologies featuring the River's Edge Poets, a group she formed and still shepherds. She has given many readings throughout the Northeast, including one at the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. As a psychotherapist and erstwhile English don at Trinity College, she has written numerous scholarly and psychological essays, but it is as a poet extraordinaire that she joins us today. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Rennie. I think. Thank you, Rennie. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to read something first from this first book that came out in 2005. It's called Leaping and Looming. And it was not published by Antrim House because I didn't know Antrim House at that time. Uh, it, and it, it contains selected works from about 25 years. I'm going to read a couple of them that uh, have been most requested and most known. The first one is My Mother's Closet. My mother's closet sloped, shoes mated in odd positions. Boxes stacking the back wall kept the eaves from plummeting to the hard, narrow-boarded floor. Afternoons, I drifted through the quiet from one closet to another. Hers was best. I could smell her there. Stroking rayon, satin, silk, I nosed around perfumed breasts of blouses to collars where on tiptoe I could tuck my head and dream. Turning my face away from falsely scented seams, I wrapped long sleeves around me. Or, more rarely, I might squat to try those troubling odors at the places where her lap would be. Oh, it was risky. I had been forbidden. Getting caught was certain and the consequence secure. Pain, long silence, then the ridicule. But I was a fool for love, so I returned to kneel among the tumbled buckles, straps, and heels. Shamed by deprivation, wondering at my own dumb need, I pulled the surplus of her skirts about me and sought some place beyond. Detached from sadness, blame, or anger, I breathed my way back to my mother, and in that imagined motionless dark, we were at one. Okay, and then this is a long poem. This is the longest one I'll read, and um, I just, it's set in Georgia in 1948. It's called An Incident in Georgia in 1948. I was born in Michigan, but my, we've moved down to Buckhead, Georgia, and that's where I went to school. Um, and I had been started out in northern Michigan, and now I was in the south, and it was quite a shock, even though I was little at the time. This took place toward the end of my life in Georgia. An incident in Georgia in 1948. One, what she remembers and what she cannot forget. She remembers the big black woman slowly leaving the downtown bus. She remembers watching her start to cross in front of the bus, the green light drawing her on. She remembers seeing the black and white coming fast, flashers blinking without a sound. She remembers knowing what was going to happen and watching while it did. What she cannot forget is the slow, stately rising of that big black woman, her flawless, silent spinning in the bright Atlanta air, her decent, steady falling head first toward the waiting road. What she cannot forget is the silence of no siren and no braking sounds, the cracking crunch of the squad car's tackle, the squash of the skull meeting itself on Peachtree Street. What she cannot forget are the oranges arced from their bag in a high fireworks spray, free at last from the juggler's arms, spinning in sunbright orbit until gravity catches them too, and they drop in a catchy rhythm of random soft plops beside the big black woman's quiet body. Two, 
what she has not forgotten, given. Now, this child watching is white and a girl, and still she knows how this death will be hushed up. Jumping off the bus, she tells the police, I am a witness. You best get on home, girl. Don't you mess in this. Write my name down, she says. I am a witness. By now, police are everywhere. Some of them take her home. You keep this girl at home and out of our business, they warn her father, who says very little. He is from Ohio, his accent suspect. After he smooths them away, he tells her, do not rock the boat. But Daddy, I am a witness. I have to testify. Mind me, he says, and turns away. She goes up to the cathedral, her high Episcopal home, to talk to the young people's canon. I'm a witness. Help me. Hush, he says. Mind your father. You are still a child. Go home. Pray for her soul. A long time after, on an inside page, she finds a few lines stating the city has paid a family, nameless, no address, funeral expenses for an unavoidable demise. Three, what happened next? It was still 1948, and this girl was still 15. Perhaps she was no crazier than she had been before, but something happened. She started integrating buses all by herself. No one wanted her to do it. Drivers stopped, cursed, threatened, threw her off. Police picked her up ungently, hauled her home. Her father took away everything, grounded her for life. Still, she went to school and then to work, and with no warning, was compelled to stroll to the back of the bus and sit and wait. Even the terror in black women's eyes could not deter her. Of course it did no good. She could see that nothing changed. As she got older, police threats changed from we're going to get your daddy to we know how to get you, girl. At 17, she went north to college. In 1955, when Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, this white woman's tears could finally testify. Four additional consequences. Truth to tell, this girl already fought for causes before she sat on that bus. Probably nothing else followed from the moment she sat there helpless to stop what happened. Still, after all these years, troubled at night, she'll see that silent flasher flashing, watch the oranges gaily rise, hear the crack, the thunk, the plopping, and always never forget. And I have an epigraph at the end on this one. I guess they're supposed to go first. By Merle Evers that came out in the New York Times in 1994. People long for justice, you know, she said. Okay, that's enough of that, huh? How about a, a short one? This one is the first book published by Antrim House, thank you, called Seasoning. Um, and the, Rennie mentioned the poetry group, the River's Edge Poets. We're down to three. Age has a way of taking people away through death and abandonment and moving away. Um, I don't forgive them, the ones who moved away, I can tell you that. But the three of us, and we keep going. And one of them, David, um, is you know, very much aware of nature and ecology and everything. So we were up at the St. Lawrence River where I have a place on an island. We go to summer workshop camp, and we really write poets. We don't just hang out. And there he was, um, all excited about one thing, and, and I said, okay, I've got you. So here's a short one, a haiku, summer haiku for David. The man of nature, running to see butterflies, tears a spider's web. He would not like my reading that, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, I know what I'll read, this one. This is not a love poem. It may sound like it, but it isn't. Um, this is called Emory Chapel. And this is Emory University. This is back in my Atlanta days. Um, and I have to tell you, I will tell you, see, I'm, I go blabbering here. This poem came out, and all of a sudden I heard from this man's sister. It had been 50 years, I think, since, or 40, since, and she saw the poem and she said, I know who that is, and got in touch with me. So it was fun to be reconnected. Who needs Facebook when we have poetry, right? Emory Chapel. It was not love. 
He was the older brother of a friend, already second year in college, studying what? I do not remember. I do recall the clear Georgia night, soft and silent. We hid his father's car behind the chapel. N then we broke in, not to damage or destroy, or not even to disfigure. We had come to play the organ, all stops out. A hymn, a lot of Bach, some rocking boogie-woogie, a last away, away, away down south in Dixie. Then we ran. No one chased us. Nothing untoward occurred. I'm not sure I ever saw that boy again. I heard his life did not go well. Okay. About, uh, well, this, this is going to sound like a love poem, but it's not really a love poem, you know. Am I being, I'll try to be good, I'll try to be good. This is called A Love Poem After the Fact. This is set up in Maine, uh, in the Rangeley Lakes District. A Love Poem After the Fact. Once, without warning, he put on skates, skimmed over wilderness ice, arms out and lifting, right as marsh hawk wings, clean lines in the gleaming day. She watched from his kitchen window, hands dishpan warm in the cabin sink, a man of moving grace, engraving faultless signatures, he edged the unmoved lake. Racing to open the door, she called through still dark furs, if ever I never loved you before, always I love you now. He smiled, spun, rose to mark the air, came down to carve the perfect shapes once more. As long as she would know him, he would not skate again. Okay, here's one. This is another... I don't think this is a love poem. You, you might have to help me with the definitions of some of these. Hmm? There's some loving in it. It's called dolce assai, which is a musical term meaning sweet enough. Uh, it's about people going to the opera down in New York. Anyway, dolce assai. Both old academics, one former, one retired, they'd met by way of opera, each with a passion for it, strong enough to warrant the bother and expense of getting to it. One day shared chagrin at forgetting tickets brought them closer for a time. Some dinners out, half a concert, email jokes. Then just the bus again, and sometimes snacks shared at the ritual rest stop. Last trip, two weeks before St. Valentine's, frenzied over X's long-term care, feelings that would not sort, she skipped the coffee break and walked around alone. As the coach left the city, she paused to say hello. He moved over and she sat down, meaning just to chat. When she gestured, as she does, he took her hand, pronounced it beautiful, and held it quietly all the long way home. This is about getting older, I think. Yes. Well, I've often said that and maybe it'll come up in another poem that the only way I get anything done is avoiding doing something else. So, um, and you've heard that phrase, that could do, isn't, does. You know, that's in New England. I heard that, learned that in New England. Well, this is called could do, is, does. She hopes to organize a group of kindred spirits, more than likely women of a certain age, and call it the Stall and Dawdle Club. If they get around to meeting, they at least will understand avoidance to be a means for getting anything ever begun or done. Not calling anyone she knows jump starts the writing of this poem. Contrary to popular belief, time flies when you are killing it. Oh well, I like it anyway. Um, okay, I'm going to do this. This is my most recent book, also Antrim House, thank goodness called How Do I Hate Thee? And it's a sampler of poetic rage against cancer. Um, I apparently had had cancer for seven years before it was discovered, as you can probably see in the picture of me on the back of this book, but I just thought I was getting older and was tired. So I'm lucky that my doctor found it when she did. Um, and the minute I got the diagnosis, I went into writer's block, which I had never been in in my life. Uh, my family told the story of my first poem, which they said I insisted they write down. I'm sorry, Rennie, <laughs> you didn't know this was coming. 
Uh, let's see if I've got it correctly. Um, roses are red, violets are blue. I love a cow who gives milk and goes moo. And that's part of the family history. I have no one left to dispute that with. So that was my first poem. Well, here I am in writer's block. And, I, I, I did, and the poets were coming. The poetry group was coming. We always have to have a poem. And what was I going to do? And I just I couldn't get by it. So I said, well, if I can't write one, I can read them. So I got out my old anthologies and teaching texts and whatnot and started reading poems I liked. And I came on John Donne's Go and Catch a Falling Star, Tell Me Where I've Lost You. And all of a sudden, this hot molten lava of rage came up that said, I won't use the language that came up, uh, that, you know, John Donne, you go catch a falling star. I'm busy catching falling hair, you know, coming out from the chemotherapy. Well, I said, that was fun. I'll finish that. So I blasted that poem apart, and I took it to the poetry group. And I haven't forgiven them yet because they said, well, at last, now we're getting some real poems. <laughs> and so for, what, almost two years, I guess I kept beating up on poems. And I want you to understand, I only hurt the ones I love. I didn't hurt any others. Um, so that's what these are. Uh, and I'm going to just read one. Well, I want, to, I want to read a little bit. I want to tell you how this came about so people understand. People would say, how are you? And I'd say, well, I've got cancer. And they'd say, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And very dismissive, just, you know, oh, you'll be fine. Think positive. Up, 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 up. Let's keep up. Smiley face. And this rage would start up again. And I finally said, this is crazy. That's not going to help. That doesn't help anybody. So... I started studying anger and my own anger and the help that was coming. So I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. Healthy anger is not negative. It helps us focus energy that can be used to resist, to fight, to overcome. Repressed anger creates depression or a dissociation that leads to unreality. Neither condition will aid to healing. And so um, don't do that to people of your friends who are sick, say, is it something I can do to help? Would you like me to bring you chicken soup? Can I drive you to your infusions? Can I help? Don't say, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine. Uh, or else you may get a book of rage directed at you here. Okay, which, where is it? Page 29. So I'll just read the one out of this. But I, This has had more of a, a life than I thought it would, and I hear from fellow sufferers or uh, recovering cancer people who say, at last, somebody gets it. So I know I'm not alone, and, and they felt alone. Uh, so it, it's been, it's made a community of a way. All right, this is from, um, you know, a takeoff of smash of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. Well, this is How Do I Hate Thee. How do I hate thee? I cannot count the ways. I hate thee with the muscle and the might my body traps when falling out of light and hope and joy and comfort, even space. I'll hate thee to the bottom of my days. Steadfast in claiming thou did not have the right to sneak into my blood some brooding night and twist my path into a sunken maze. I hate thee with the energy I kept for children, peace, and justice all around. I hate thee for the way thou held me prepped, seven years, I'm told, till thou were found, thou so adept, and I so damned inept. I'll only hate thee more from underground. Okay, that's that. I won't hurt you with any more of those. <laughs> oh, where am I here? Oh, and here's, here's one. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you like this one. We'll see. Didn't I hear that you read this yourself one time when you were pretty sure I wasn't there to hear it? Yeah, well, so trying to tell people. Somebody came up to me the other day. I had a Yukon bag and said, what, do you like Yukon? I said, well, yeah. And they said, well, what do you like? I thought, well, this is odd. I like the girls' basketball. Well... And I said, listen, man, you weren't there. You don't know what it was like back in my day when women's basketball was bounce, bounce, pass, and you couldn't cross the line. And oh, what did they worry that it would hurt our innards or something? So I and all the cotton tops I know get off on women's basketball. We are so proud of them, okay? So girls can't do that. Girls don't do that. That's what we heard all our lives. Well, here's a poem called Girls Don't Do That. That refrain clanged with menace over my youth. I wanted to mow the lawn, not scrub the toilet bowl, but girls don't do that. 
I like jacks and jump rope. Red Rover kicked the can. Only jump rope was approved. And what I really loved was baseball, staring down the pitcher, pulling back and letting rip, vibrations zinging through my life. Girls don't do that. Well, I did, and was not sorry. Am not sorry. Only pissed that no was everywhere. B wearing blue jeans, taking physics, wanting to study rocks. Girl did that, so there. This is a, a new poem, and uh, it has an epigraph, I got the word, uh, by Carl Jung. The epigraph says, nothing has a stronger influence on their children than the unlived lives of the parents. More and more I think of her, oh, this is called Mother and Me, sorry. More and more I think of her, mid-July and her birthday again. Born in the first decade of the century, she managed finally to die in the last. For over 20 years she had waited, more than ready to go all that time. More and more I think of her, alone, lonely, and lonelier still. There seemed to be nothing I could do. No change I offered called up a yes. Now here I am, understanding at last. Her unlived life has caught up with me. Well, let me read a couple of my grandchildren poems. Uh, and I'm sorry I've gone on so long because I wanted to read all six of them and I don't think I have, maybe if I read real fast, I can. Uh, this is when Sadie was a little baby. No, little girl. Lunch with Sadie. She takes with sharp, unstudied grace the bit of cheese so diligently cubed. Her fingers fine and perfect move it to her ready mouth. Her budded teeth. And I am yet again undone, wanting time and age to stop. To hold with pen and camera, with dimming vision, and an old grandmother's heart. This moment, this perfection, this justifying life. And here's her younger brother, Will. I call this There's a Way. You know where there's Will. There's a way, right? Okay. Will is here, and I have borne none of the pain and danger, just the pleasure of his coming. A sweet William he is, holding him, admiring, smiling, making gooey noises. I catch a fleeting look of his mother, his father, his aunt, his uncles, his grandmothers, his grandfathers. Will, all by yourself, you might just cure your grandma's neophobia, her fear of all things new. This is one, a grandson, this is for um, the youngest one of that three. A grandson gentle with the aging. I just wrote this one. The youngest of three, he's quick to aspire to be king or commander of all. Any stick will do for a saber or sword to conquer the brawl. When Nana sits, she tries to catch on and help make towers or castles or lakes to find the Legos that fit the plan and repair any piece of the game that breaks. When his mother comes home, he reports on the day, placing his hands on his hips, he kindly explains without any blame, Nana cannot fix spaceships. And this is the, okay, another one. This is for Kyle with, wrote this in August too. A most particular grandson. He climbs up on her exercycle, the one placed by her sons facing the flat screen television, so she'll have no excuse not to ride while watching. He sits quiet and composed. His father comes in and out again, fixing stuff for Grandma, who's sitting in her rocking chair, chattering on about what Froggy and Turtle might be thinking on her old round coffee table. He sits patiently, watching everything, paying attention to each. When at last she stops blabbering, he looks her right in the eye and says, I do not think so, Grandma. I don't think so at all. This one is coming over the mountain for Jackson, who's the youngest. And you know that, the, what is that, an old nursery rhyme or a song coming over the mountain? Well, this one, when I'm coming over the mountain to see you, little one, I won't be driving six white horses or wearing red pajamas. Yet I know how we will greet each other with quiet observation and share a little smile. This trip I see for Scythia, some wildly yellow, some restrained, some red buds near the rushing river. What cheers me most are greening willows, long since the true first sign of spring. Jackson, I imagine you will want your supper first before you're ready to play footsie with me. And that's how it should be. I just wish you could know how you have helped bring spring back into my life and pulled my winter out of discontent. And the last one I want to read is 
this poem, um, and I won't go into, though I'd love to, about what happens when you write a poem on demand and the pressure that builds up, how painful it is. <laughs> so this is a river poem. This was a wedding poem. It took me six months, and the poets hoped I never had to do another, and I ended up having to do two more. River poem for Morgan and Rory on the occasion of their marriage. One evening this summer, just at dusk, two black ducks light on the rocking dock. They are, I think, taking a break from rough water and rising wind, sitting, picked out by the setting sun, comfortable, close, and trusting together. Up in tall grass nearer the house, fireflies begin their evening dance, a silent show of perfect light, not as random as it appears, part of things as they are and have been a long time. In the still dark before morning, I lie and listen hard as one loon calls and calls, flying over, flying back. At last the other answers, and I can sleep again. This is all I ask for you, this staying together in whatever is, steady in all winds on all waters, shining for each other in the evening, answering one another in the night. Thank you, Rennie. Thank you really for asking me. I, I hope it was okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. With okay. Me. Oh, Elizabeth, that was, uh, that was all over too quickly. As you said, time flies when you're killing it. Thank God you were not killing it, but uh, perhaps killing a little bit of cancer, killing a few of the blahs, yeah. and uh, letting that hardball rip right into our mental mitts. So thank you for that you. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, half hour would had it had been an hour or more. And um, I want to also thank uh, Ken Picard and Karen Handeville who make this program possible uh, and say to you that if you would like to learn more about Elizabeth Kincaid Ehlers uh, and read samples of her work, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. Uh, you may also be interested in other Antrim House poets, not that any could live up to Elizabeth Kincaid Ehlers, of course, but if you would like to see others, uh, they're on the website. Uh, and uh, do come back again next month for the 14th installment of Speaking of Poetry.